start streaming, and should I record this part too? Sure. And we should be, yep, is it back on now? The YouTube should be back up and running. All right. I'm going to unmute. If I can find where the mouse went. Where's the mouse? There it is. I wanna un I gotta move him this back over for a minute, Jamie, so that I can unmute. Um, you can go ahead and unmute, Phil. If you can. What? Wait, wait. I can't get. Hold on. I gotta unmute him. There we go. Hang on, Jamie. All right, what's up? Yes, please. So I adjust. Yep. All right. We're we're back. We're back in. We're a few minutes late, but we will be fine over lunch. Next up, we have Dr. Phil Wanyerka, who is good to go. Take it away, Phil. Are we ready to go? Yep, we are. Can you hear What's me? Happening? Oh, he can't hear me. Yeah. Open up my. You're muted, you're, you're muted in Zoom. How did I mute myself? Hold on. So I'm muted. Okay. Hold on. We're getting there. I think we are just. Uh, Unmute me. All right. Okay. Right. right there. Okay. Now I'm back. Now go ahead, Phil, and start. Sorry about that. We muted ourselves. All right. So we're ready to go? Yep. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Hey, I wish to thank Bafo for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. I'm here at Clueless State University in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the more interesting work that I've been conducting lately of the earthwork, the only known earthwork complex in the Rocky River Valley of the Cuban Metro Parks. Uh-oh. Sorry. There we go. Uh, Fort Hill, Site 33 one first site recorded in Cuyahoga County, was located in Olmsted Township in Cuyahoga County, Fort Hill is a triple earthen embankment uh, site located a variety of soils and varying textures and colors to produce an enduring and symbolic rich earthen form on a monumental scale. These types of earthworks were largely non-defensive for the most part, rarely residential uh, structural debris of any kind. Uh, Fort Hill sits 100 feet above the Rocky River, atop of a vertical. The site was first published in 1878 by noted Cleveland archaeologist surveyor Colonel Charles Wilsey, and later expanded upon by Matthew Canfield Reed. However, we do have early newspaper references to Fort Hill as early as 1850, but the site was well known prior to Wilsey's um, publication. Earthworks of Northern Ohio was The article states that the Fort Hill uh, is uh, in the widths of the wall were approximately 15 feet east west, and that the ditch between each wall was about 15 feet or 11 feet wide. The walls were about four feet high with no clear visible entrances into the embankment. Uh, an enclosure can generally be defined as an open space that's specifically bound for some purpose, at least by architectural elements. There are at least two other major triple embankments. One since it was first reported in the late 19th century. The second earth bank, earth and work, is located in Lake County and is known as the Lyman site. Or this photo of Indian Point shows you, gives you an example of the in Ohio. And it really demonstrates what the Fort Hill earthwork likely looked like in its heyday. The date for this earthwork at Indian Point falls around 137 BC, making it an early woodland construction that ends up being contemporaneous with the Fort Hill earthworks. Earthworks of this type in northern Ohio 
are often found in association with significant water features. Um, here you can see the Rocky River, um, which at one time split and went around and encircled the Four Hill Plateau at some point in the past. Royal earthworks from the Ohio Historical Connection from their archives that likely dates to the 1930s or 40s, showing the height of the wall of the earth walls. The Cleveland Museum of Natural History conducted limited archaeological investigations. Five, their investigations located only two pieces of church sabotage. In 2016, we were granted permission say, by the Cleveland Metro Parks to set up our um, did a survey and contour map of the whole site. Much located directly west of the earth. Together, these mounds likely serve as gateway mounds, marking the official entry. Mounds are fairly visible today due to previous plowing by early settlers who plowed much of this land for Historical sources indicate that James Rupel, one of the settlers in Olmstead Township, plowed the top of Fort Hill in the mid to late 19th century. Even the LIDAR data the students met Barbado was tasked with the job of creating a 3D rendering of the Fort Hill Earthwork Complex. I think he did a really amazing job bringing this earthwork back to life years ago. Here's a view looking east through the center line between the two gateway mounds towards the embankments. With the discovery of the two gateway mounds, we're now referring to the study as an earthwork complex. Here's a view looking south. Notice the water in the ditches. I'll come back to that shortly. To date, we have conducted 10 major geophysical surveys at the Fort Hill Earthwork Complex using our FM flux gate magnetometer and our ground penetrating radar. Here we are setting up our survey grid. Assessing the, the geophysical veil. And then during this survey, we recorded more than 25 mag magnetic anomalies. stairs leading up to the site while carrying all of our gear. In 2017, we excavated um, an anomaly located on top of, located just below the surface. We uh, discovered a firecrack rock feature associated with the initial construction of the earth. This feature appears to be more like a scattered firecrack rock and bits of charcoal rather than a typical fire hard feature. Since there was little oxidized soil, charcoal gathered from this feature yielded an AMS today, but 60C, making this earthwork basically an early woodland um, and or an Indina construction. This was an important discovery to now date the construction of the Fort Hill earthworks. In 2018, we returned back to Fort Hill to conduct further excavations. Our plan was to one located in the ditch on the easternmost embankment highlighted here on the right, and two in the tree line west of the earthwork in order to compare the strategic view of the earthwork uh, um, with that of the sterile subsoils. So we have a good idea of what the site. However, the area west of today with pine, oak, and maple trees is making it really difficult to conduct certain areas in this area of this western part. However, we just simply Located just below the surface in one of the areas we did um, was a large post mold. 
Um, this post mold was between 45 and 50 centimeters. Um, and though the post was missing, it contained a large clutch. Chart would appear that the post was pulled at some point in the past. Um, and Serve as a marker, perhaps to to uh, a mark astronomical through uh, astronomical uh, rituals associated with either the solstice or the equinoxes. In 2018, we also excavated for each of the Earth and the Bankers. So a ditch can be defined as linear depressions that are placed parallel to the interior or exterior of the anchor walls. The ditches at Fort Hill were specifically lined with glacial clay, um, that blue-gray clay. You see the entrances to the primordial war places sprang in mythic times. Our excavation. As we dug further down, we encountered a piece of the layer just above the bedrock. We found the light scattering of charcoal and the firecrack rock as if someone simply threw these materials across the floor. Thank the fire to bless the earth works to um, total construction. Same year, we also took the results of the survey were quite remarkable. Here, while the rains prevented us from really investigating all of these features, we did manage to dig a couple of them. It was clear that several of them were post molds. Um, we're not May, what the post may represent. It could be an outline for a larger structure or some other um, perhaps yet to be identified structure. All this remains tenuous until we can do further ground truth. We did excavate two of them. All right. We did excavate two of them. Though the top most, though the top post mold in this particular view is difficult to see. What was yet? The one on the right is. As you post, unfortunately, not enough charcoal was recovered to run a radiocarbon date on this feature, but also due to the pandemic, we have been able to return um, all these anomalies. Now, let's turn towards um, the artifacts. Um, and we really haven't recovered the artifacts found in our investigations of the three seasons have literally. Dated to the middle woodland period, between 100 and 500 AD was found on the first day in 2018. We did recover many artifacts in the three seasons, and we did find lots of trash in the most sacred places, perhaps in church. We did strongly supports the notion that we're dealing with an important ceremonial site. Even the soils appear to be carefully screened because we found no rock whatsoever in any of the fill. Um, we also found a, a triangular grape vent tool, which was made out of chert. The on to a wooden handle at one point, and likely used as a cutting tool. We found a couple of slate scrapers, uh, a brownstone self, and a urine likely used for some type. And of course, we recovered more than 200 pounds of firecrack rock and all of the different features that we were looking at. Um, results of the botanical survey um, uh, 
uh, Catherine Parker from the University of Michigan is looking at a large quantity of red cedar, a tree considered sacred by many woodland cultures, but we had pine and a variety of oak. In terms of other plant materials, our sample contained early food crops, pigweed, and a podium, little barley, and gourds. Likely date between 360 and 150. Like the rust in the concentration rituals. Dating between 161 BC and AD 65, placing this feature at the interface between the occupied or used the boreal ceremonial site. The presence of living at or utilizing the boreal um, complex suggests that native people thought of this rock. Was a sacred location for a long time. Twenty years ago, early antiquarians suggested that some of these promontory earthwork sites may have functioned as signal signal or to communicate some sort of message amongst each other. We're not sure if that fits here at Fort Hill, but if you, you do have an excellent view of other archaeological sites. From the top of this hill. In 1850, Charles Whittlesey referred to these types of work sites as forts or fortifications based on their strategic locations. Early colonial forts like Fort Pitt on the right here look similar to many of the earthen constructions, and thus the comparison is often made to these types of earthen embankment sites that they likely functioned in a very similar way. Geoastronomers suggest too that many of these earthwork sites may be used. An astronomical observatory to observe the sun, the moon, or some other astronomical body. Such landscapes, many cultures often made references to solar happenings and the calendrical day, the solstices, and the equinox that can be observed along the horizon or skyline. While working there, we noticed the uh, solstices, noting that that center line between back. With that whole one, the sun rises directly. Sign from market to know sunrise on a fall and spring. Just the southernmost position from the sun. Um, the moon uh, was also a particular celestial body that Native Americans paid close attention to, as you all know. The moon with that 18.6 year cycle, as we know from other sites like the great Newark Earthworks, where the landscape was designed to encapsulate the various rising and setting points. Still need to investigate here at Fort Hill, marked through the earthwork itself. So that sort of leads us to. These sites use the social gathering places or pilgrimage. Earth enclosures tend not to be the locus for domestic activity. They tend to be very sparse in these kind of complexes, suggesting um, specialized uses. The notion that the earthworks were sacred ceremonial gathering places persisted. Suggesting a more symbolic usage and purpose. With the discovery of the gateway mound, mound the enclosure, likely that these mounds signified precise processional way, uh, entrance way into the enclosure um, known. The place also provides the physical setting for everything. Certain features that haven't changed significantly since prehistoric time. Conditions of hills and valleys relative to the rock rising and setting points of the sun and moon are essentially the same as they were 2,000 years ago. Sometimes these features in relation Maybe beyond our ability to recognize. So, 
to the earth, the sky, and these watery realms. Close to the end here, just another couple of slides. Where the eastern woodlands and occasionally have come. Work suggesting that the lack of degree may indicate space and the deposition of waste. However, it is clear that the earthworks like Fort Hill facilitated engagement with the sacred. It was these locations that were marked by the prehistoric people of Ohio through the creation of earths and mounds. So I want to thank you um, for helping having me in here today. I want to CJ, Michael, Mike, Rachel, and Clem for all of their continued support of our work at Fort Hill. So, so thank you, everyone. Have a great day. I uh, hope you guys. Terrific. Thank you so much. And now we'll move right on to David Huben, who I think can go ahead and share your screen. And I think I can also make this bigger. Let's see. Oops, no. There we go. Okay. Are you all seeing that? Yes. Yep, I think we're good. Okay, great. Township Cobra Cemetery. Um, it stems from my thesis work here at North Carolina. The president of Ira Lab, uh, which is running the excavations and the field research associated with it. So I'll introduce the project, right? This multi To and contribute to these research goals. Uh, as the title suggests, I'm particularly concerned with examining a uh, historical narrative formation process, uh, or more appropriately, the cemetery through time. Uh, my approach revolves around dual lines of evidence sources to which I also add reference to some oral traditions as shared with the excavation team. And the other line of cemetery thus far. Importantly, right, I'm concerned the process at the cemetery, right? And how we can sense uh, of what we're seeing there. I'll wrap up. To head with future research. This photo of the site just prior to the start of our work in 2018, uh, and this quote from John Scott, who's a professor and minister at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, during the cholera epidemic of 1832, which we'll touch on. That reigned for much of the cemetery's span of active use. Right? So, in a fiery sermon delivered from the pulpit, right, and distributed to the public in the form of extraordinary precision, the abodes of vice, the haunts of intemperance, debauchery, and Every moral, so far as we can learn, every day, 
Talk about victim blame, right? Uh, like I said, I leave with this how ingrained the stigmatization to the general populace came in a clear understanding of the mechanisms behind the cemetery specifically. First burials are believed to be those of Thomas and Sarah Rennick in 1804. Same day. Specifically, that come through the area. Cemetery was supposedly used for you see that there are burials happening uh, throughout this time in between the uh, In fact, it's on old Route 23, just south of the Franklin County border in the village of the township in Bowie County. has owned the property since, it is now maintained by Harrison Township. Right. Excavations at the Harrison Township Colorado Cemetery bring together interests, right? The goals of the site, understanding the lives of connected to the low socioeconomic status, they are historical accounts, and when possible. So, two of those aren't exactly mine. Our principal investigator, Dr. Giuseppe Bercialotti, and our son, who is with you all today in person. Just how was the evolution of historical narrative? Cemetery's history, right? Okay. Specifically, the way emotion and social memory uh, play into the documentary record, right? So, so, material record that's caught up in this historical narrative process. Stem from Wilkie's interpretive historical archaeologies, coming from Hodder, basically. Documents as labors of representation itself and compares that with the archaeological record. So, through my documentary analysis, right, what did we see? Initially, during the Conrad epidemic, because the record is more complete. Cholera victims and intemperate or immigrants 
right? There's a lifestyle that's associated with these things. Ignore and the situation that they are living in. So widespread that it's essentially habitus for the populace. And this is where silences entering the written record. Timeline just shows some of the documents that cholera epidemic struck through the land that was owned by Joseph O'Bannon and Rennick at the time, where the cemetery exists. Right? Died in one mass mortality event. Status individuals are prioritized. Mortality census reflects a says in the margins some 10 or 12 others in addition to the cholera victims already listed. And I'll come back to this. So we later see the cemetery being attached to cholera victims in a obituary. Have buried 11 victims and so presumably the cemetery. Document that was reviewed is the index of stones. This was an inscription effort in 1936. What's so interesting about this as a document? That basically mirrors the Dying of cholera in uh, accounting for individuals. Uh, to be associated with cholera based on what has been seen elsewhere, right? Slaves, hastily dug graves with haphazardly deposited bodies. What we're seeing is a lot of care and emotion and um, it shows right some uh, aerial, some some ortho imagery of the cemetery and the excavation. It's about fifty-one burial features identified. Uh, Thirty. Children and infants, they have no historical record. 27 coffins, or evidence for coffins. So, this is West East, as you would expect. And these were not quickly dug. And So, we look at the 
surface, right? Which is construction materials that was probably used. This spot complete with the daughter of Thomas and Sarah Rennick. Township color cemetery. Interestingly, the cemetery in Circleville, Ohio. Right? So the memory that once was cemetery for a non color. Buried, forgotten, shifted alongside his widow. Now, there's nothing um, being commemorated at another site, right? But it's interesting when we think about historical sites, cultural sites like this. Right? Winter Welton and from any record at the cemetery. Shows some of the lodges at the cemetery, right? So we have the burials. Through the written record, cemetery opening in Circleville, right? And a quick Cemeteries, right? As well, cemeteries. Could have gained some information was through this. Uh, we lose what the cemetery is then devoid of headstone. So, without looking at these, ties canal workers, cholera victims, farmhands. Site prior to our arrival, uh, through talking with uh, township trustees and representatives, these so, right, as I said. We by uh, walking out to the cemetery and getting an idea of who is so they lean on and share time and time again and that will starting in 1849 process of historical narrative reformation. So how can we maybe counteract or counter, counterbalance the effects that are going on there? Yeah. 
historical record. What you see here is the 1850 mortality census. Shirk's headstone has been moved by right, his family. Uh, the itself was moved, just the headstone. documented with these other individuals, the hope is what you see is just an expansion of that burial roster based on the Daughters of the American Revolution inscription efforts, uh, showing you know the names that we have added historical research. Share that with the descendants and to explore space. Just about out of time. Sherry Rook. That's, she actually joined us on site. Her and Kathy Rash. Safe, uh, in a week's time, and look forward to sharing those updates with you all next time. Thank you. Go ahead and minimize this. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the Zoom part now. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And with this, we have one more talk before lunch. Um, I apologize to those listening on YouTube. I've been fielding some text saying that the song wasn't very good. That was something that we weren't anticipating. So if you've been watching this on the live stream, we will try to see if we can maybe re-record those talks or do some uh, 
work with the audio to try to improve that. So this was our first time we've ever done this, so I figure a little bit of cutting out is probably okay. There could have been worse things happening. Um, our final speaker for the morning session is Dr. Jared Burks. Let me just find your, where did we put your, there's, okay. Um, oh, no. Get you open up here. Um, this is you, right? Is that you? Yep. All right. We have to, it's weird you have to work. That's literally you. All right, yeah, make his slideshow start. And there you go. You want to go up to the top? The button's cut off. Slideshow. Hang on. Let me just make this fix this. Right? No, stop touching it. There we go. This is a pointer. You got the laser pointer there, and this should forward and reverse it. Thanks. If it doesn't, I'll come fix it. It didn't. <laughs> Jamie, can you put the mice back where it belongs? It just does a weird set of <laughs> okay so now it oh, works. Wait, there it is there's time delay or something now put it back jamie can i afford here i'll just do it this way with all right. the keyboard all right there Old we go tech. okay <laughs> no it's on that's good i know we're seeing it so. okay right. stop moving <laughs> okay so i'm going to talk uh this morning about some work we've been doing at the snake den site and also in Pickaway County, actually, not very far from the Cholera Cemetery. This is a little bit older, though, deeper into the past. Um, Snake Den is a, a mound and enclosure site, um, and it's uh, located there to the south of us. Um, you can see some of the other earthworks uh, from the 1914 William Mills Archaeological Atlas of Ohio. Uh, so Pickaway County has lots and lots of mounds uh, and a number of enclosures, too. Um, this is where the site is topographically. It's, it's kind of just in the low hills to the east of the Souda River there, which is at the left. Um, the hills really pick up over toward Lancaster, which is um, just to the right of the, the earthwork there. Um, is there a way for me to be able to see my slides here without having to look over there? Or is there not? No. Um, no? Maybe. Hold on, let me. I'll keep talking, but. That would save me from doing this every two seconds. Yeah, um, we tried. It's because of the way the setup is done here. Where'd the mouse go? Right. We'll do uh, our best. Keep talking. Okay, I'll keep, keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> so uh, Snake Den is about seven miles from Circleville, which is the largest nope, earthwork. that didn't work. So, you know, that didn't work so well. Um, nope, those are the wrong ones. We'll get there. And uh, there we are back. I may not be able to do that for okay. you. That's okay. Maybe I'll just crane my neck. I can't see it. From she here. can't see it on the screen. Yeah, so it just gets hard. If we do it like this, if I just, if we just can turn this a little bit right, so you fine. can that's see fine. it better. Okay, that's weird too. Uh, it, it's about 20 miles basically from us here, so not really that far away. And then 35 miles to the biggest earthwork complex in Ohio, Newark Earthworks. So it's sort of out in the middle of nowhere, but right in the middle of everything in a way. And that's, sort of the a typical description from, I think, most hilltop enclosures, even some of the, the big ones. Um, this one is not a big one, um, but there's a lot going on there, as you'll see here in a second. You wouldn't know there was a lot going on there from the first map published of the place, really the only map um, from the 19th century uh, made by Clarence Loveberry and, um, and Warren Moorhead and published in 1897 um, in one of the uh, Ohio Archaeological and Historical Society publications. So from this map, um, we know that there are three mounds at this place. Um, the one on the left is a stone mound. The one on the right is an earthen mound. The thing in the middle is more of a platform with a little mound on it. Uh, and then that thing marked E, which is what caught my attention, is supposed to be a circular enclosure. I have kind of the fever, you know, for circular enclosures. Um, so uh, that's what got me interested. Uh, and then there was a mystery enclosure. Uh, they didn't really get it on the map very well, but that's more or less where they thought it was there, uh, number F. Uh, what really caught the public's attention um, wasn't that map, um, thankfully. Uh, it was the excavation work that happened there uh, in the 1890s. They trenched into some of the mounds, found numerous graves, of course. Uh, but um, this thing here that they're all standing around um, really caught the nation, I suppose, by surprise, in particular for some of the objects that were found at that location. This is a zoom in. Those, those little blobs there on the right are 
silver nuggets about walnut sized. They're in a little iron concretion container. Um, and these were buried with a number of other geofacts. Lots of conc large concretions, you saw those things there, size of like bowling balls um, on down to cue ball size and, and maybe even smaller. So kind of an unusual grave. Um, these things end up, ended up touring the country, I think. Um, and at least one of them made it back <laughs> to Columbus. Uh, so that all happened in, in the 1800s and around the turn of the century. Um, my interest in the place started a little bit later, 2007, although it started to feel like it was the turn of the century. Um, and uh, this is what this site looks like uh, this year, actually. Um, the mounds are right here in this little woodlot. Um, the circular enclosure, uh, my, the object of my affection, is right there. Um, an, another mound is it was described in the text but wasn't on that map. It's, it's a couple hundred meters away. It's, it's actually along the driveway um, to that house you see there just to, below it. Uh, and today it has a nice pipeline corridor going through the middle of it, which we'll see here in a minute in the magnetic data. By the way, pipelines are magnetic, if you didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, we've had the opportunity to do lots of cool things out here. Uh, the site does show up in LiDAR data. Um, this is not LiDAR data. Um, this is actually photogrammetry data. So this is a drone flown by Helen flying around taking photographs and then a 3D model made from the photographs and I've gone in and clipped out all the trees. So the real textured areas are parts where there's vegetation on the ground that you can't just clip out. Uh, but as you saw in that, uh, previous slide there, the mounds are covered by trees. Um, so this is kind of a nice way, uh, if you have the time and the expertise, to, to make a very detailed, like way too much detailed um, topographic map. I think there's a reading every probably centimeter and a half, like maybe too much. But hey, we love data. Um, and you can really see the state of the mounds. They have these depressions in them today. They were looted at some point um, after the excavations in the 1890s. Um, you can also see that other mound there with the driveway kind of cutting across the north edge of it. Um, and maybe you notice this thing going around the outside there. That's not a plow mark or a fence line. That is an archaeological feature that when I started in 2007, didn't know it existed because I was, I was focused in on that circular enclosure there. Laser focus. Um, so, uh, of course, when I started the MAG survey in 2007, that's what I focused on. Um, it pretty much, this is in 1976, so uh, it, it looks almost just like this today in terms of that dark area there is where the trees are. You can see the pipeline corridor. So we kind of knew where the circle should be. And we started surveying there and discovered that, hey, that's not a circle. That is a squircle. Um, <laughs> some kind of super ellipse shape um, with a little gateway there to the southeast. Um, and... Um, we just built from there. And what we're detecting here is the ditch. So the ditch of this enclosure has been filled in. The embankment is somewhat topographically visible, even in the photogrammetry data, um, but it's, it's pretty subtle. It's been plowed, plowed flat. Uh, so the map is actually pretty good, um, if we could only find where F is. Um, since 2007, we've done lots more mag data, um, lots more mag survey. And uh, I think you can see that outer enclosure showed up. This was right about when the LIDAR data became available and when I said, oh, maybe we should look at snake then and topographically with LIDAR data, it's like, oh, duh, there's, there's the outer enclosure. Showed up well. But the, the part there to the lower right where the uh, pipeline is, is flat, so we, we couldn't see that bit in the LIDAR data. So it, it looked like as of 2013, there was some kind of ditch and embankment surrounding the entire hilltop. Uh, but what was really freaky uh, was what was going on down here at the bottom. Maybe you can see those little blobs and lines there, lots and lots and lots of them. These appeared to be pit features, maybe, or posts. What's a little bizarre is that they're, but there's a bunch of them, that's kind of bizarre. They're in a line, uh, but they're down kind of on the slope of the site, which was a little freaky. Um, it's not a place you would normally look. And you'll notice that the line of them cuts across the outer ditch and embankment. So, huh, some differences in time here. <laughs> and if you look real close, you'll notice there's not just one in this data set, there are two. Um, we had an opportunity to excavate one of these, or actually two of them, um, with some help from 
an archaeological field school that was going on in the region in 2014, led by Deanne Weimer and Paul Pacheco. Deanne brought her team and, and some of the uh, SUNY Geneseo students up here to excavate a few things. And sure enough, that blob in the mag data is a feature of some sort, about 90 centimeters in diameter, got some burned rock in it, had some charcoal in it, and produced a mystery date, <laughs> 900 BC. Seems a little too early um, for most of what we know about mounds and enclosures in Ohio, but it, it is really the beginning of mound building in Ohio. So maybe that's not a crazy date. It's going to remain a mystery for a little while. We, we don't have another date yet, but we're heading in that direction. Um, since that time, 2014, the landowners have formed a nonprofit organization with some other community members, and they've set aside this property um, for preservation. So it's still privately owned, but it's now part of this 501c3 nonprofit, which is pretty cool. And part of what they're using their new nonprofit group for is public education. So they're starting to bring school kids to the site. They're teaching about the site in the local school systems. And of course, some of the family members here are retired school teachers, sort of a no-brainer. Um, and they also um, have used some of the funds um, for good to clear some of the underbrush beneath the trees so that we could do magnetic survey in there. And so what you're seeing here uh, is magnetic data collected with a handheld mag in the wooded part of the site. A little more challenging to do in there. Um, but uh, that's what we did uh, a couple of years back uh, and have previously presented here. But um, you can see the mounds show up nicely. Um, there's this little circular thing here right next to the pipeline. Uh, maybe you can see it there, I think, in the mag data. That thing there might be a post circle. Um, and uh, let's see, what else we got here? This, the outer enclosure there is showing up in the woodlot. Maybe a gateway in it. Um, and uh, maybe another uh, enclosure right there. I'm not sure about that one, it's pretty subtle. So that's the stuff we did uh, a few years back um, during COVID, I, I guess it looks like. Um, we, uh, we also took the uh, cart-based mag out there to kind of fill in the nooks and crannies at the edges of the property. With the handheld mag, you have to collect the data in grid squares, so it's kind of hard to, to do the edges. It takes a long time. But with that cart-based mag, you can drive it all over the place, push it all over the place. It's pretty easy. So uh, I wanted to see if these lines of posts um, or pits or whatever they are did something else down here at the edge. Um, here's the data. We just resurveyed that whole area. And uh, actually what happened was we found yet another row of these strange burn features. Uh, so the big mystery um, by this point was what happens to those lines of of pit features, do they go on to the neighboring property? So this year, uh, this winter, what we did was, you'll notice there's a, a little more magnetic data up here in the woods. We, we filled that in, but something happened that we didn't quite expect. Um, up to this point, we didn't have access to the neighbor's property. They wouldn't let us survey out there, but things change. So it's always good to keep an eye on these old sites. Uh, and we got access actually to the neighbor's property. So here's a, another one of those drone views. Um, the mounds are there in the foreground. And that, that uh, parcel back there is uh, what came up for sale recently. So it's like, hmm, uh, this is right um, where the mound is uh, that we've been talking about. Um, and there's about 10 acres there um, that we were interested in looking at. Um, and in particular, you know, the big thing that was driving me was uh, what's going on with those pits? Do they keep going out into that, that field there? It's not exactly flat, but it's more or less at the same level as the, the mounds and the enclosure there that we know about. So, of course, the weather was gorgeous. Um, it was sunny. I mean, you can't ask for much more in January. Uh, and Al was in rare form, uh, <laughs> one of the few selfies he's taken. Um, it was a little chilly uh, that day. Uh, but we had some really, really good results. Um, surprising initially, only because my memory was failing me on <laughs> what I already knew was supposed to be there. Uh, but the mound showed up, um, no big, no surprise there. Um, but if we zoom in on that mound area first, um, I think maybe you'll notice sort of an arcing, um, pretty subtle, but arcing thing uh, seems to be under the mound essentially. So maybe a post circle 
uh, there. It's about 24 meters in diameter, so pretty typical for these size things that we've been finding in magnetic surveys. Um, you'll see uh, this other really obvious circular thing here. This could be a trench or a ditch type feature. Um, I suppose it could also be posts. Um, it's a little bit smaller, 22 meters in diameter. And then if you've got the earthwork fever and you like looking at mag data, maybe you notice that. Um, another kind of circular thing in the mag data that's really subtle. All right, so this was the, the elephant in the room, obviously, that nice rectangle there. Um, we weren't expecting it when we started collecting the mag data, but we, we should have expected it, as you'll see here in a minute. Um, it is not huge by any stretch of the imagination, um, 30 by 40. Um, to give you a sense of scale, here's a real famous site in Ohio, um, Mount City Group, maybe you've been there. Um, it's Our new little rectangle is pretty small compared to Mount City Group. Uh, but it, what's really unique about it, and I think this is uh, the only earthwork of this shape um, that I know of so far in Ohio, is it has gateways at the corners, which is sort of reminiscent of the big mega squares that come later, I suspect. Uh, has an obvious gateway there on the uh, east side, and I think there might even be one there on the west side, but there's some other features getting in the way there that the magnetometer detected. So we're not sure about that west side. Um, at that point, um, we had detected all these cool things, um, and uh, we decided we needed to extend the survey to the south because maybe um, you noticed um, some other little blips and blobs in there that look very intriguing, um, in particular these things here, right? Uh, so we extended the survey to the south, and um, I was reminded, I often post these things on social media to keep people's interest peaked, and I was reminded by David Lamp, hey, you remember when I sent you that aerial photograph that showed the rectangle? <laughs> it was like a few years ago. Um, well, yeah, Dave, I, I guess I remember now. It's subtle in there. You have to really be looking for it, but sure enough, there it is. Always good to look at old aerial photographs. This one's 1964 when working around mounds and earthworks because you really don't know how far out they extend um, from these uh, things that we can see today at the surface. Um, so back to these little blobs here, these probable pit features. There are lots of them in these data. Um, the other challenge here is that there are a lot of big granite boulders out here that the glaciers dropped off. Um, very nice of Canada to send those south. Uh, they're quite magnetic, so one never knows necessarily if, if some of these are boulders. And we even found a good-sized boulder in one of these pit features in an excavation. Um, so those, are, those add to the complexity of the map. Um, but if we start looking for these things, you'll notice that they form lines and they head back toward the mounds and they seem to connect up, maybe, um, with those lines of pits that we had found back in 2007. Um, in the end, um, found lots and lots of these things all over the place. Um, and uh, at this point, um, the, the landowners were getting kind of urgent in their need to sell the property, uh, and we needed to make a decision. How much should we try to buy? Could, could we even help purchase this place? Uh, so we brought out the big dog, um, the toad magnetometer system, to cover lots of ground. We only had like a day to do it. Uh, and we moved to the south and surveyed as much of that farm down there as we could um, in that day. Uh, and you'll notice some really strange data collection patterns here all over the place. Uh, that's because my GPS signal kept dropping out. I had it set up over by the mound way over here. And whenever I went behind, it seemed like whenever I went behind the house that's up here, I lost the signal. So we had some gaps in the data, and I didn't want to take the time to move it because that would take effort, and I was being lazy. You know, riding around in a UTV makes you lazy. Uh, but we did want to check this little bump here, see if there was anything on that. And uh, we checked over here because it seemed to be where those lines might continue on if they just keep going into infinity. We didn't find any um, over here. Okay, thanks. Just about done. Did find lots and lots of more possible pits down there. This bit of a ridge that's extending through this field from, from the earthwork complex kind of south. So uh, it kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, again, these could be rocks too. Um, and that's what we ended up with um, in the end, kind of up near that rectangle um, and those other circular things here. And, and there's the enclosure there. So lots of crazy pit features um, out there. Still not certain they're pits. They could be posts. Um, 
they make these neat lines, and yes, um, we're getting some help with examining these angles to see if they're important astronomically. Um, they do seem to be kind of on that summer solstice sunset line. So we'll look more closely at that. Going to require some visits from people in the know on such things. Um, and we also went out to test some of these anomalies because at this point we weren't certain actually that we'd be able to purchase the land. So the red ones there are ones we cored, Al and I, um, with, a, with an Oakfield soil core. These were the positive ones. So definitely that stuff we're seeing that looks so obvious here, those are all, there was so much burned rock in those, we couldn't even get the oak field through, well, below the plow zone, just like clunk, clunk, clunk. Um, and you pull it out and you see the tip of it is red and there's a little bit of charcoal there. So definitely archeological features. Um, not sure about that one. And then these ones were negative. So I don't know about that really long line of widely spaced possible pits there. But, um, this is my, my final slide for you guys. Um, there is an update. I got it this morning, actually. Um, there is, has been an offer that's been accepted on the property to the south um, by some um, like-minded farmer types that are um, interested in helping with the preservation cause. And uh, we're very hopeful that this bit of the property is going to become part of the, the property to the northwest. And so this site will be become whole-ish, or at least more so again, um, at least in terms of preservation. So um, keep an eye out. This may become, uh, I mean, it is a, a new archeological, you know, um, earthwork preserve in Ohio and Pickaway County. Uh, and that's hopefully, fingers crossed, everybody's gonna have to do that. Um, soon to be added, this new stuff we found this winter. So that happened really fast, surprise. Um, yeah, that's it, thanks. got that news this morning. That's yeah. amazing. This, this is crazy. I know. I don't touch anything. Don't, <laughs> don't touch breathe anything. over here. <laughs> so um, we are done with our morning portion now. We're running a little bit late, but we have an extended lunch, so we should be just fine. We're going to stop the YouTube streaming now, and we will pick that back up at 1.30 with the four more papers and then end it for our business meeting. As I said, if you are in town right now, you have until you know, about an hour and 15 minutes. If you want to make the quick trek up to the Ohio History Center to see the exhibit, you have time to do that. Or we were, I'm, we're going to end promptly at 4 o'clock today of our business meeting, so you have an hour afterwards as well. So um, have a great lunch. Go outside, enjoy the sunshine, and we'll see you back here at uh, 1.30. Here, I got... Right, can you, yeah,